was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last breath. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloth. They found an unused tomb in the garden, and they laid him there, and then sealed it with a heavy stone. Saturday inside, surely it was soon. Since when has it possible ever stopped you? Friday's disappoint, Sunday's empty too. Since when has it possible ever stopped you? This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Dry bones rattling. 
perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. This is what he said. Everybody and man, let me tell you something. That song rattle. I love that song. If that, that don't song get you going, like... I don't know what to tell you. But welcome to Easter at New Spring, everybody. And if you're joining us from home, we just want to say happy Easter to you. My name is Meredith, and this is my friend TT. Um, sorry, I didn't know if you wanted to say your name or I was going to say your name. But welcome. <laughs> we are so glad that you joined us today. And let me tell you. You obviously know you've joined us for a special day because yeah. it is Easter, but what we have planned, what we've been brainstorming, what we've been praying over today, I believe is truly gonna meet you wherever you are. And listen, if you're like, I don't know what to expect because I've never really been here before, then welcome to the fam. If you're new, hope you, hopefully you can already tell this is a family. Yes. We want you to, to feel like you can be yourself, that you can tune in wherever you are. And if you are new here, we would love to connect with you. So if you would text the words new here to 30303, we would love to connect with you wherever you are to encourage you, to maybe get you involved with our church and to let you know a little more about who we are. And speaking of who we are, yeah, we have a vision statement Come on. here at New Spring, uh, where we say that New Spring is a life-giving church mm -hmm. marked by the presence of God, activating us to impact others. Yes. And ultimately, what, a, what does this church have for me? We wanna be life-giving for you. We believe that the gospel is the most life-giving thing in the world. And so we wanna be life-giving to you, your families, and your home. Come on, and if you're interested in jumping in and ready to jump in to be a part of this New Spring family, we offer something called Connect Classes. In our Connect Classes, you will learn what New Spring believes about God, and you will also learn what God's plans and what He wants for you. Connect Classes are a series of four classes four. where you will learn God's plans and purposes to save us, free us, and fulfill promises through yeah. us. And so I would really encourage you to just text CONNECT to 30303 if this is something that you would love to do. And Mayor touched on family, and family impacts others. And yeah. a way that New Spring believes that we can help impact others is through our giving and our tithes. We believe that the first 10% goes back to the local yes. church. And listen, we don't believe this is an obligation. This is actually a partnership. It is a way that you get to partner with God through giving and tithe. And so I would encourage you, sign up for giving and tithing. We have several ways that you can give and tithe. You can go to newspring.cc or you can download our New Spring app. And on the app, you can actually set up reoccurring yep. giving. So it just comes out of your account. You don't even have to like do it yourself. Like that's amazing, so simple. And I would just really encourage you to join in and jump into yes. partnering with God through your giving and your tithe. TC, you couldn't see my face, but you said this isn't an obligation, this is a partnership. It and is. I literally made this face. I because mean, that's when it hits good yeah. is when you make the bad face. <laughs> and that is what we're inviting you to yeah. is partnership and giving, yeah. partnership and family. Yes. And also I'm gonna invite you to participate and to partner with this message today as we celebrate 
the most important event of human history. Yeah. And that is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Come Jesus on. Christ. Uh, one of our pastors, Brad Cooper, is going to be preaching today about multiple resurrections that happen in Scripture. So I'm telling y'all, get the app out, get a notebook, and get ready Jump as in. we get to lean into the greatest story ever told, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on.
Amen, 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 amen. Let's praise him one time. Come on, let's give him a hand clap. We praise you, Lord. Jesus, we honor you. This is about you because you live. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Now, come on, let's do it right here. This is it. Yes. We praise you, God. Yes. Because you live. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Church, go ahead and grab a seat. Wow. Easter Sunday morning. Did you miss it? Did you miss it? Hey, I want to just tell you welcome. I want to tell you that we are so honored to have you here on every single campus. As a matter of fact, Anderson campus, could you help me welcome all 14 campuses are now live with us. Would you help us welcome you? How are you? I hope you're well. God bless you wherever you are across the state of South Carolina or if you're tuning in from your house. Because he lives, because Jesus Christ lives. This is a celebration of life. Today we sing about life. Today we preach about life. Today we declare resurrection life. And uh, I'm so excited to be with you. Uh, if I don't know you, my name is Brad and I'm one of the pastors here. And I just want on behalf of all of the pastors at New Spring Church, our volunteers and our family, if you're joining us because you're visiting maybe on spring break or uh, maybe you're just checking out the church for the very first time, welcome. We're so grateful to have you. We're so honored that you'd be here today. And uh, we're gonna have a really, really great day, but I wanna pray for us real quick on every single campus. Father God, thank you for your resurrection power. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you for life. Thank you that it's still on offer today. And so God, would you, would you show up and speak to each heart in each room? In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen, amen. Well, I wanna ask you a question. Uh, this might seem like a shocking question, but it's one that I want to ask to begin this sermon today. Yeah, and uh, it's meant to shock because we're here singing about life and we're here talking about life and we're, we're believers in the power of resurrection life. But this question is one that I've wrestled with and I bet you've wrestled with as well. Whether you grew up in church or not, you've probably wrestled with this question. And I'm just going to ask it, all right? Why in the world are we scared of death? Why are we scared of death? I mean, we're singing about resurrection power. We're singing about Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior. But the reality is, if we're just being honest, we're scared of death. We're scared of death for ourselves. Parents, I know some of you, you would recognize that you're scared of death. You get that, that 15-year-old that gets their permit, and then they finally get that chance to drive their car. And all jokes aside... They leave that driveway and you got a little trepidation in your heart because they're driving their vehicle and you're scared. You feel that. Maybe it's because you've got aging parents and you feel a little bit of fear. How long are they gonna be with us? How many more Easter's? How many more Christmases? How, how, how many more years? They're scared, fear in our hearts. Maybe it's, maybe it's something else. I, I, you know, as a father, I, I can tell you that both of my oldest two girls at different times, they've, they've asked this question. It's a pure, innocent question. And I can remember their little three-year-old heart asking at bedtime, in particular one night, hey, Dad, are you and Mom going to live with us forever? Hey, Dad, what happens when you die? I don't want to be alone. And it's in the heart of every human being and we recognize it. And I just want you to know that this sermon, this message, I feel like God put in my heart for you so that you might not be scared of death. That the reason that perhaps we are scared of death is two primary reasons. One is we don't understand the heart of God or we don't understand the power of the gospel. And so I wanna make it plain today. Are you okay if I make it plain? By God's word, I want to take you on a tour of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you're taking notes, I want you to know there are five funerals and five resurrections in the Gospel story. Five funerals and five resurrections. And each one of them teach us about the heart of God and the power of Jesus Christ. I just want to say really clear, I want to look you in the eye and say really clearly, we're not here today because we believe in a fantasy fairy tale. 
We're here today because we believe in the actual power of resurrection life. And we believe that that resurrection life is not something that just occurred 2,000 years ago. It's something that is still present today. And that you, yes you, you have access to it. If you would understand the heart of God and the power of his gospel resurrection. Hebrews chapter one tells us that in the old days, God spoke by his prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken clearly by his son, Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the exact imprint of the, the glory of God. That if you really wanna know what's God like, look at Jesus. And so we're gonna jump in and look at Jesus today, church. Are you okay with that? If you're okay with that, say amen. Amen, amen. Well, let's begin our journey. And the first funeral and the first resurrection that we find in the Gospels is actually in the book of Luke chapter 7. And it's, it's a story, a compassionate story of a widow. And this widow is in a city called Nain. Now the city of Nain, we don't really know a whole lot about, and that's the point. But we do know that when Jesus shows up, there is this woman who is specifically told to us to be a widow. The point here is that the gospel writers want us to know this woman was acquainted with loss. She had already grieved the loss of her husband. That's why she's a widow. And on this day, she is walking with a huge funeral procession out of town as she buries her only son. This woman had double grief. This woman had double loss. This woman had taken incredible pain, incredible mourning, and she had not taken it once, but taken it again. And we see Jesus Christ come in with his disciples and there is a collision, death meeting life, funeral meets resurrection power. And Jesus goes straight to this woman. She doesn't know him, but she can tell when she sees his eyes, he knows her. He has love and compassion in his heart and he embraces her and then he does something that everyone in the crowd would have gasped. <gasps> He reaches over and he puts his rabbi hands on the dead body of her son. And this would have taken the breath away of the crowd because by Levitical law, if he touches anything dead, a dead animal, but definitively a dead body, he would have been considered unclean, unfit by Levitical law to enter into the synagogue, into the presence of God. But how many of you know that when you are the very presence of God. You can't be removed from the presence of God. And so Jesus Christ puts his hand on death and death does not soil Jesus, but the life in Jesus as he speaks the words to this dead man. And he says, young man, I say to you, arise. And here's the theme of Easter. When the voice of Jesus speaks to the funeral, the funeral's over. And the resurrection begins. And this is the first account we have. It's the story of a compassionate God. I need you to feel the heart of God. He has compassion. One of the reasons that this is such an important story, the very first resurrection, is this is one of the only accounts in the Gospels where Jesus was not requested of. There was not a mother here begging Jesus to heal somebody. This was not a father here begging Jesus to miraculously do something. This was not a blind man coming to Jesus saying, heal me. This was Jesus showing up and surprising a family. I want you to know that Jesus, his compassion wants to surprise you this Sunday morning. The heart of God wants to surprise you. He wants to, he wants to clear the air. If you have any question about what God is like, let it be heard loud and clear that the compassion of God is to show up in your death and surprise you, in your loss and surprise you, in, in the chaos and surprise you. And it is his heart to be compassionate. That's why in Luke chapter seven, he literally says in verse 13, these words, Luke seven, verse 13, it says, when Jesus saw her, this widow, he had what? He had compassion on her and says to her, do not weep, do not weep. Now again, we read this 2000 years later, but I want you to imagine being there. What would you have done if you had been a part of the funeral procession when all of a sudden this man lays his hands on this, this young man and says, young man, I say to you, arise. What would you have done? What would you have done? I'm sure as soon as the young man gets up, the miracle happens and the tears of sorrow turn into tears of joy and the grief 
turns into dancing and celebration and everybody's mouth is filled up with these words. Who is this man? Who is this Jesus? Who is this Yeshua? Who is he? And the rumors begin to spread. Maybe he's a prophet just like Elisha. That's who he is. He's a prophet just like Elisha. But nobody doubted that this man had compassion while they were still trying to figure out who he was. That's funeral and resurrection number one. You ready for funeral and resurrection number two? If you are, say amen. Amen. The second one happens one chapter later. And this one is different. This is Luke chapter eight, and this is the story of faith. And this is a story to show us the faithfulness of our Lord. And it's the story of a man named Jairus. Now, Jairus was a synagogue ruler. This story is teaching us something about religion. This story speaks loud and clear to the southeast part of the United States as we have religious activities that'll fill up auditoriums on Easter Sunday, amen? But this man, Jairus, he was gonna put his religion and his social standing aside. And in the city of Capernaum, when Jesus shows up, people had already begun to witness his miracles. And Jairus, he had two voices in his head that day. One was the voice of everybody else in his religious social structure saying, Jesus is a rebel. Jesus is, is a breaker of the law. Jesus is to be ignored. Jesus, if you follow him, you'll be kicked out of the synagogue. That was one voice. But Jairus decides to push through that voice because Jairus has a 12-year-old daughter who's on the very verge of death. And when pain and suffering get to a point, you don't care what religion says to you, you will push that aside to get to, desperately get to the one who can do something about your suffering and your pain. And so Jairus comes up to Jesus, pushing the crowd aside, falling at, feet, at the feet of Christ. And he says, Lord, please, my 12 year old baby girl, and I can just tell you, I want moms and dads to feel this. What would you do and how far would you go if one of your kids was at the verge of death? No physician had a cure. There was no way to help her. And he comes begging Jesus and he throws his social standing aside and he falls down and our Lord embraces him and says, come on, take me to your daughter, I'll heal her. On the way home to Jairus' house, he's leading the way and somebody from Jairus' home comes and meets them and says, you can stop. Your daughter, I'm so sorry, Jairus. She's no longer ill. She is actually crossed over. She's left this life and she's passed away. She's dead. You can leave the rabbi alone. Upon hearing this news, Jesus actually says to Jairus, no, 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 just believe. Come on, let's go on a little further. He gets to Jairus' home and he says, she's not dead, she's only sleeping. The crowd in the house in Jairus' home, they start laughing, church. They start laughing. <laughs> what? Is this prophet crazy? This little girl's She's not sick, she's dead. The breath has left her body. She's already begun to get cold. Rigor mortis has started to set in. And he says, yet again, come on, let's go in, Jairus. Just believe. He takes Jairus' wife and a couple of his disciples. They go in and again, watch this. Again, he lays his hands on this baby girl. And he says, little girl, I say to you, arise. And wouldn't you know it, when Jesus speaks, funerals stop. And resurrection power filled her body. Her life flowed back in and oh, she breathes. She gets up and moms and dads, I just want to ask a question. This is not meant to be rhetorical. This is meant to hear you answer. What would you do if you were standing over your dead son, your dead daughter, and your savior called them to life? What would be your reaction? Oh my gosh, ah, oh my goodness, there would be tears of joy. I don't know, I would take a praise lap. I don't know about you, maybe you grew up in a Pentecostal church. There would be some laps being taken in that house. I would be hugging everybody, all COVID aside. I've had my shots, I'm doing it, okay? I'm getting it going on, I don't care because my Jesus has shown up and he has spoken right into the face of death and he has called my child to life. This is the story of faith. The faithfulness of God, look, 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 puts faith in the hearts of men and women. And that faith is meant to be activated. That faith is not meant to just sit silently in our chest. It's meant to drive us to belief. And when we take our faith and we combine it with his faithfulness, watch out. Resurrection power 
is on display. That's the story of faith. That's the story of Jairus. That's just funeral and resurrection number two. You see it, I wanted to point it out though in Luke 8, 50. I wanna show you that faithfulness. It's in the text. But Jesus, on hearing this, he answered to Jairus, do not fear, only believe and she will be well. That's the Lord's word to you this morning. You might be staring down something unbelievable in your life and you need to hear your Savior say, don't fear, just believe. Walk with me. I can still speak. I'm faithful and I can bring things that look dead, marriages that look dead, circumstances that look dead, medical situations that look dead, prodigal children that look like they're gone. I can still speak. Bring your faith to my faithfulness and watch me put my miraculous resurrection power on display. There is a faith that overcomes death, church. That's who we worship today. The third story that I wanna point out is one that maybe perhaps you're familiar with. It's recorded in the book of John chapter 11. And this story did not happen in the rural towns of Israel. This story actually happened in the bedroom community of Jerusalem, in the religious center of the Jewish people, in the home and in the family of a friend of Jesus. This is the story of love. This is the story of Lazarus. And this is the story of a family uh, that Jesus knew very, very well. Now, you maybe know this if you're familiar with the Bible. During Jesus' ministry, he spent three and a half years on the Sea of Galilee, but he traveled around. And when he would travel like a good Jewish man with his disciples into Jerusalem to show up and pray in the temple, he would stay at the Airbnb of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. That's where he spent his time. So he had eaten many meals with them. He had, he had had lots of conversations with them. They were very close. And Mary and Martha send word to Jesus when he was not in Jerusalem, not in the town of Bethany. He was out doing ministry. Hey, Jesus, John eleven three tells us, the one whom you love, Lazarus, your boy, he's sick. Come and heal him. And you know what happens? Jesus lets time go by. I need you to feel this. Maybe you would consider yourself a follower of Jesus. Maybe you would consider yourself one who loves the Lord. Maybe you would consider yourself one who is loved by God. And you too have felt the absence of God during the presence of a struggle and a trial and a a circumstance in your life. Let this minister to your heart the love of our Savior. Many times he keeps us at a distance where we can't feel his hands, but it is intended that we would trust his heart. And you might be walking through a situation, a circumstance, a relational thing, and you wonder, where are you, Lord? That's exactly what Mary and Martha wondered. Where is our Savior? Where is our Lord? As Lazarus went from sick to worse to dead. The Bible records that they buried him. They mourned him. And that he was dead for four days before Jesus decides to show up. Jesus brings his disciples into town, and Mary and Martha hear he's on the way, and One of the sisters comes out to meet him and she is absolutely broken. Real grief. She loves her Lord and she says, if you had only been here, Lord, I know that you had the power to save. I've seen you resurrect before. Jesus declares to her, I am the resurrection. She says, I know you will resurrect my brother on the last day. I just imagine Jesus winks at her because he doesn't say anything. He just He just grieves, he just embraces, he mourns, and then he says, let's go to the tomb. Let's go to the grave. Everybody follows, all the mourners follow, and something incredible happens when they get there. Jesus says, hey, remove the stone. The sisters actually say, no, Jesus. No, Jesus, he's been in there too long. We didn't have any of our common medical stuff going on. And so one of the sisters actually says, Jesus, we're gonna smell his rotting body if we open up the tomb. Jesus says, do it. So they remove it. And then he speaks these words. The Bible says he said it loudly, so I'm gonna do it, okay? Lazarus, come out. Can you imagine what the people would have felt? (gasps) What? This is insane. And then walking out of the grave comes the man they buried four plus days ago with his burial clothes on, wrapped up, and all of a sudden, 
yet again, when Jesus speaks, the funeral is over and resurrection has begun. Can you imagine the celebration of this family as they embrace their brother, as they embrace one another? Can you imagine the conversation? This is not just the prophet who can call someone back to life right as they have died. This is something more. This is God, this is the Messiah. Yeshua is the Messiah. Oh my goodness. And the Bible records that they tried to make him king that day. The Bible records that Jesus, he retreats to the desert for a week, but then he comes back through the town of Bethany the week of his crucifixion. That's why they threw palm branches down. That's why they shouted, Hosanna, here comes the one, the powerful King Messiah. This is the one. And listen, the religious ruling leaders, they were scared to death because they were afraid that Rome was gonna crush their insurrection and they were gonna be thrown out and and all of the people would die and, and Jesus is coming into town and people are going, this is the King, this is the one. Which brings us truly to our fourth and most well-known funeral and resurrection story. This is no longer the story of love. This is the story of justice. Justice. This is the story of Jesus Christ coming to do something that had not yet been accomplished in any of the resurrection stories before. Here's what I want you to catch today. This is so important, church. This is being missed right now by a lot of people. If Jesus had resurrected the widow's son, if Jesus had resurrected Jairus' daughter, if Jesus had resurrected Lazarus, but he had not satisfied what sin had done to humanity and satisfied the wrath of God, it would have been unjust to call them from death to life. I need you to feel that. If Jesus Christ had resurrected this little girl, this 12-year-old little girl, but he had not died on the cross himself, it would have been unjust. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The Bible says in Romans chapter five, verse 12, that by one man's sin, Adam, the door was open for sin and death to enter into our world. And so Jesus Christ was on a mission. He wasn't just calling people back to resurrection, life, he was actually gonna satisfy the wrath of God against the brokenness of humanity. He was gonna open the doorway back up for you and I. The Bible says that the reason that there is power in the earth for sin and death to exist, the reason that Satan is called the accuser of us is because he has right to accuse us because if we are still under sin, then there is a demand on our life. That demand on our life is that we would die for the sin that I have committed and that you have committed. That is why Jesus Christ and his death is so unique. What he did on the cross is so unbelievable because he didn't die his death, church. He died mine. He died yours. That's why the Bible says very clearly in the book of Isaiah chapter 53 verses four and five. Let's read it together. Isaiah 53 verses four and five. It says that surely Jesus has borne our griefs and he's carried my sorrows and yours. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for who? He was pierced for his sins? No, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for me. And you, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Pause. Look, look, look. That means that we are not at peace with God if Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross for us. That means that we are at enmity with God. That means that that the accuser has a right to call us his. Satan has a right to our lives. He can make a demand on you. Because of the brokenness of our choices and our sin, past, present, and future. Unless Jesus dies on this cross and because he dies, now we have peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. That's the good news of this Easter sermon. That's the good news of this Easter message is that now we have an opportunity to be healed. This wasn't just the prophet in the Old Testament. This was the apostle Paul in the New. He wrote to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And he said very clearly, for 
our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, the perfect spotless lamb. He was on the cross and he was our sin. He was punished for it so that in him we might transform and become the righteousness of God. But when this moment occurs, his friends and followers, they did not realize what we know now. They thought that the Lord, the one who had resurrection power in his mouth, was dead and that the movement was over. They could not figure it out. As they saw him tried, as they saw him beaten, as they saw him spat upon and humiliated, stripped, this man that had compassion and faithfulness and love that they had experienced in their own lives and they'd seen countless times as he had ministered to people, all of a sudden he was he was gonna die? What? It didn't make any sense. But sure enough, the Romans put him on that cross and they lifted him up and they hoisted him high. Right there between two criminals, men that deserved it. And he, he, could, have, he could have done something. Why wasn't he doing something? Why didn't he call down the angelic force? Let it not be missed. It was because he chose to die. The Bible is very clear that Jesus chose to follow the will of his Father because he knew, just like he cried in the garden, that this was the only way for sin and shame and Satan to not still have a hold and a claim on your life and mine. That's why he did it. That's why when he got to that last moment on the cross, he shouted an Aramaic word, to tell us die. And he gave up his life. It was over, it was finished. People that were standing there that day, they thought it was just his life was finished, but it was actually sin and shame and Satan's grip. And yet again, when Jesus Christ speaks, the funeral's over and resurrection has already begun. But his followers didn't know that. They just saw him. They saw the Roman soldier come and put a spear in his chest to make sure that he was dead. His lifeless body just hung on the cross. Vultures began to gather, as they always did. Dogs began to gather, waiting for a piece of flesh. Joseph of Arimathea and some of the other followers decide, no, not our, not our friend. We're not gonna let him be just commonly thrown aside like all the other bodies. Can we get his body, please? They begged it. They allowed them to take the body of Christ down. They prepared it. They, they wrapped it. They placed it in a tomb. You can just imagine the grief, the mourning that they would have been feeling. What is going on? I thought this was the one. I thought this was the Messiah. They sealed the tomb. Roman centurions guarded it because the Pharisees asked. They didn't want anyone to try to play any tricks with this man. He had already caused too much problem. And so his friends just wept. All day on Sabbath, Saturday, they cried in silence. What is going on, God? The next morning, the Bible records that some of the friends of Jesus, led by some ladies, went to the tomb. I can just imagine the dew on the ground that morning as they walked early, like the tears of God, all of nature and creation was weeping the funeral of Jesus. But as the sun came up on that first Sunday morning, they get to the tomb to see something that shocked them. It was rolled away. The stone, where was it? Where were the guards? They're gone. They look in and where's the body of Jesus? It's not here. There's the clothes we wrapped him in. They're just laying there. What is going on? Confusion. A couple of the disciples, they turn and run to go tell the brothers, but Mary, Mary lingers, weeping, confused, not knowing what's going on. You can just imagine, again, all of this disruption in her own heart. She hears some rustling out in the garden behind her. She thinks perhaps it's the gardener. Maybe he knows. Maybe he knows what's happened to my friend, the body of my Lord. Excuse me, where, where did you put the body? Where is my Lord? 
she sees, maybe, maybe the sun was in her eyes a little bit. She couldn't quite make out the face, the complexion. And then all of a sudden, this gardener was no gardener. He says, Mary, and calls her by name. The Bible records, she knew who said her name like that. She turned around to catch the eyes of her Jesus. What? Jesus, you're alive. What is going on? And then all of a sudden, it was just clear. She knew. She knew that this wasn't a prophet. This was the Son of God. This was our Savior. This was our Lord. When he yelled to Telestai, he was speaking about all of us, all of our sin and our shame, the accusations of Satan, all of us that needed to die for our sin. He was resurrecting in power to pay for that. And now that Jesus had spoken, the funeral was over and the resurrection celebration could begin. And so we find ourselves in the wake of this reality on an Easter morning 2,000 years later. And so I want to ask you a question because we're going to just take a moment and pause. We need to worship. We need to consider. Have you heard the heart of God with his compassion, with his faithfulness, with his love, with his justice for you? And if you have, would you join me for the next few moments in not being silent? Let's stand to our feet on every single campus. And let's allow this moment to minister to us as we put all of our glory and all of our praise and all of the honor on our King, who is not dead, but he is alive. And he doesn't want you to live under the weight of sin and shame and Satan's accusations any longer. And you're not supposed to. So Father God, would you be honored now as we worship you, as we reckon with the very personal reality that you died for me. And Lord, I pray that you would speak clearly now to every single heart in every single room. Would you call names? Would you speak compassion, love, faithfulness, and justice to all of us? In Christ's name we pray as we sing and worship now. Amen.
Amen, amen, amen. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down. My whole life down before you. You know, we've talked about four funerals and four resurrections, but there's one more left. So I'm gonna invite you to take a seat on every campus for this last one. Because the beauty of Jesus Christ and his resurrection is the Bible talks about him being the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. You see, because God has not only had compassion and faithfulness and love and justice, but he has also given you and I the dignity to make a decision. A decision that is not parental, but is personal. Your spouse can't make it for you. Your pastor can't make it for you. It's gotta be yours. It would be equally unjust for the Lord to resurrect you to eternal life without dying for your sins and without you placing your faith in that reality. And so there's something we must address. We must address the reality of our own death, our own funeral. I know it's stark, isn't it? It's heavy. Brings back memories, perhaps. But the reason that the Bible says that when you are a follower of Jesus, that we grieve and mourn saints differently is because of the truth of what we're talking about here today. It's because you and I are going to live forever. And every one of us gets to decide, are we going to respond to Jesus and his offer of love Or are we going to reject it? And I want you to understand this. There is no other option but one of those two. Every single one of us will either decide to receive it or decide to reject it. And so I want to ask a question today. 
have you decided? Because here's the reality. There is still a Jesus who speaks. And when Jesus Christ speaks, my funeral is over and my resurrection life has begun. And I know what that sounds like. Do you? Do you remember the time when you heard the voice of your creator? When you were wrestling with the reality of your own sin and your own death? I can remember. I can remember that. I can remember wrestling with it for days. Understanding that my sin was going to lead to eternal death. And that I did not know Jesus Christ as a personal savior. And I can also remember, I can remember the moment that I responded and made the decision and said, Jesus, I wanna lay my life down. I know I'm a dead man and I do not want to live my life any longer. I am done. And I say yes to you. And now I don't fear. I preach that gospel to myself. And I want you to have that same kind of fearlessness because what a scared world needs is a fearless church, is fearless men and women living a fearless gospel reality because they know the heart of God and the power, the resurrection power. Now listen, I wanna go ahead and put on notice right now the spirit of religion because he's here. And he'll fill up Easter Sunday morning in the South and he'll let you think that you just, you know, you went through the motions back in the second grade or back in the fifth grade. But the reality is, here's how you can identify the spirit of religion. It's activity without power. It's going through the motions, but not on purpose. And you, listen, that's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter seven, many will say to me on that day of judgment, Lord, Lord, didn't I know you? And he's gonna say, I'm sorry, you did not. And I don't say that, and he didn't either, to scare you. He said that so that you might be warned that the spirit of religion will lead you to hell. And you need the spirit of resurrection. You need the voice of Jesus Christ. You need to listen and respond to him. And you don't need to let the spirit of religion that causes us to put on our blazers and get on our Sunday Easter best to keep you living in the grave. Paul knew about that spirit. He was a follower of all kinds of religious activity. But look what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter two. Here's the imagery of death again. Galatians chapter two, verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. But look, 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 look at the next part. He says, what compels him? I've underlined them for you. It was knowing the loving compassion of God. It was knowing, look, what is it? The faithfulness of God. And it was knowing what? the justice of God, that God had taken his place, that allowed him to respond to the voice of the creator. And so on this Easter 2021 Sunday morning, I want you to know that Jesus Christ, we believe has been speaking to hearts all morning long and he's doing it now. And so now we're gonna get the chance to lay the old man or the old woman down and respond and get to make the dignity of the decision that God has given you and I. Can I invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads? Listen, why do we close eyes and bow heads? It's because we're joining with God. Right now, we're not looking at the outside. We are joining with God, looking at the heart. As you look at your heart, are you alive? Are you resurrected with purpose and power? Because you've heard the voice of Jesus Christ at some point in your life, you remember that moment. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you have a perfect life. It just means that you know you have heard the voice of Jesus. He's called you on purpose to life, to live for him, to lay your life down. Have you had that moment? Or perhaps this is the moment. Maybe there was all kinds of circumstances that led you to this gathering today so that you might hear the good news gospel of Jesus Christ, so that you might respond. Maybe perhaps you know the weight of your sin, you know the weight of your addiction, the brokenness, the affair. You know how the jealousy, the anger, the anxiety, the things done to you, the things that you've done. You've, you live in the shame and the weight of that all the time. And maybe you've been medicating yourself, trying to entertain yourself, trying to move on to a new relationship, move to a new town, move to a new job. But today, all of that can stop. That striving can stop 
that dead way of living can stop because you are hearing the voice of Jesus. I love you. I didn't just die 2,000 years ago for those people. I died for you. I've paid the price. I've got compassion for you. I want to surprise you this morning. I'm faithful now. Will you take that little seed of faith that's in your chest that God has planted there and will you just like Jairus, will you respond? Will you push through the voice of the enemy and will you reach out and lay hold of your resurrection because it's here. The way you do that is right now through prayer, you just say, Jesus, I say yes. Jesus, I say yes. If that's you today, I just want to invite you right in the silence of this moment, just say yes to Christ. Jesus, I receive you. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. Just in the silence of this moment, ask him to forgive you. Forgive me, Lord. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shutting the mouth of the accuser. Thank you for making a way for me not to live with the weight of sin and shame breaking the power of sin over my life, the claim that death had over me. Thank you for slamming the coffin shut. Tell him now that you'll follow him in your own way. Lord, I'll follow you. Wherever you say go, I'm gonna go. Whatever you say do, I'm gonna do. I wanna live for you. I wanna live a life on purpose and a life with power, not just a nominal Christian life going through the motions of South Carolina Christianity, but I'm going to live on purpose for you. Not just Easter Sunday morning, but the week after Easter, the Tuesday that follows, my career, my relationships, my financial situation. I'm going to give it all to you. I'm going to give my, my, my athleticism, my, my high school friends, I'm going to give it all to you, whatever it is. I want to follow you. Because when the voice of Jesus speaks, the funeral stops and resurrection begins. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. But if you've prayed that prayer, you've heard the voice of Jesus, you've responded to it, I just want to give you an opportunity to, to respond by raising your hand. So I'm going to count to three. Heads are bowed. But I want to just pray a prayer for you. And if I can include you in that prayer, you've prayed and received Jesus today here for the very first time. I just want to invite you to raise your hand on three. One, two, three. If that's you you said yes to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hold them up. I just want to include you in a prayer. Amen. 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 Hold them up. Hold them up. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Okay, you can put your hands down. Father God, I thank you for the harvest that you have just done this morning. And so, Lord, you are the one we're going to glorify. You're the one we're going to celebrate. You're the one, God. We're still, just like those people 2,000 years ago, blown away from the morning has now become a celebration. And so we're going to honor and give you glory now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would everybody open their eyes and look at me? Can we all celebrate? There were dozens of people here I saw on every single campus responding to the voice of Jesus. Yes, Lord, be glorified. Praise you. Wow. Here's what I want to invite. I want to invite everybody on every campus to their feet. And while you're getting to your feet, I want to invite you to do something. Would you take out your cell phones, every single person, every single one, because we, we were going to give these folks a chance to respond that just prayed for the first time. I want everybody to take their phone out, but if you were one of those folks that said, hey, that's me, I heard the voice of Jesus today. I wanna to invite you to text the word Jesus to the New Spring number 30303 because you didn't just get saved today, reborn today, resurrected today. You also got a whole brand new family today. You got a whole bunch of saints around you all over the world and we celebrate and we wanna welcome you. We wanna walk with you. We wanna journey with you in the days ahead. And so if you don't mind, take a moment, everybody do this. Pull your phone out so maybe the person beside you or around you feels comfortable enough to do it. And just hold your phone while they're texting Jesus to 30303. If you receive Christ, we're going to send you a link and we want to correspond with you because we are not just excited that you have come out of the starting blocks. We want to see you go across the finish line. Now let's worship. Let's sing. Let's celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Father God, be glorified now. We're blown away that your voice is still speaking and calling dead men and women to life. To you be the honor, the glory, and the praise. King Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Come on, our only response all across the state is to do exactly what men and women did when Jesus called their name. 
was to respond to the resurrection and the life by being resurrected and having new life and praising Him. And there is resurrection power in this room. So we're gonna join with heaven and we're gonna celebrate because the resurrection power is in this place. Come on, lift your voice and let's declare this together. And there is resurrection power when we sing the name of Jesus. Resurrection power when we raise Pushing back when the darkest weapons form. There's a power on my lips, even death can't defy. When the name of our God is lifted, I come on, every voice, there is resurrection. There is resurrection power when we sing the name of Jesus. Resurrection power. We raise a mighty sound So come on, let the praise get loud Make that empty grave resound Cause there is resurrection power In His name There are days I have seen Filled with heartache and loss That have buried my heart beneath them but every time his praise breaks out, dead things rise up from the ground. I will leave my soul inside that empty grave. Cause there is resurrection power when we sing the name of Jesus. Resurrection power when we raise a mighty sound. So come on let the praise.
What an incredible day. What an incredible word. Mm -hmm. What an incredible song. Yes. It's just been such a good day. The death and resurrection of Jesus is something to celebrate. Yes. And listen, if you've already given your life to Jesus, I would challenge you today to just sit and process what that means. Yeah. Sit and process what you resurrected from, where you were and Come where on. you are now. And if you haven't given your life to Jesus, I would encourage you to do so. Like yes. life with Jesus is so Free. You die to your old self and you come alive in who He has called you to be. You live out in full purpose of what He has planned for your life. And there's nothing more freeing than that. Yeah. And listen, if you're interested in that, we would love to walk you through that. We would love to talk you more, talk with you more through how to do that. You can text Jesus to 30303 yes. and someone will reach out to you. You do not have to do this alone. We are a family and come we are on. here for you. And you will never, ever, ever walk through this journey of walking with Jesus alone ever again. Yeah. And let me just encourage you, please text that number yeah. and text that word yeah. if you have any question about it. Because the last thing we would want is for you to leave today with having something inside of you stirring to do that yeah. and walk and be like, nah, I'll do it later. Right. That is, the enemy's favorite word is later. Yes. Today, text that number and we would love to connect with you because we do want you to participate in this resurrection life with Jesus, mm -hmm. which is what the next few weeks are gonna be about in our church, is that the resurrection of Jesus is not just for our salvation, mm -hmm. but is so that we can live in the reality of the resurrection every single day afterwards, that the resurrection affects every single aspect of our lives. So next week, Clayton King is gonna be preaching about how the resurrection life is a life of adventure. Let's go. It's not boring, it's At not all. secondary, nope. it is not just a religious, like apathetic thing, no. that if we live in the resurrection reality, then we will live a life of adventure. So and I'm true. telling you, there are a few people who I know who live that life more than Clayton King. So please come next week and jump into this series with us. We love you guys, have an incredible day, and we'll see you right back here next week. Are things about to get weird? Yeah. So that's really so difficult to have a conversation with someone about sex because they, no, no, you're not talking about something I'm doing. You're talking about who I am. Right. The church has done a disservice to overteach marriage. Yes. And underteach fulfilled, yes. beautiful single life. That's why they're called cessations. We're the opposite of that. New Spring is the opposite of that. I feel like the Bibles then were completely different than they are now. They were so thick. <laughs> and so for that me, it was like cover. super, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was that super pace. intimidating. <laughs> yeah. And so it was like, I never want to read this Bible. Right. People that want to move in the power of the Holy Spirit, but they don't walk Come on. in holiness. And that's witchcraft. Thank you.